Well, we're scrambling around in the dark up here. I don't know if you saw that over there, but we, my notes got flung to the wind. And then magically, uh, John just produced another complete set of notes. I don't know where he got them. He pulled them out of his hat, I guess. Um, so I don't even know if they're in order. So we'll see what happens. And you know, the crazy thing about this is, uh, that's a good thing because we're not, I'm not gonna, I'm not planning on teaching today, I'm planning on preaching, okay? Now, if I was teaching, I'd want you to be quiet and take notes and say, hmm, interesting. If I'm preaching, you need to get your praise on a little bit, and if I say something you like or that steps on your toes or that inspires you, you need to vocalize. Now, here in Livermore, it's rodeo country. So you can, you can do that, or you can just do the old Southern Baptist. Wait, are Southern Baptists really vocal when you preach? No. Why did I look at you? Are you a Southern Baptist? <laughs> All right, let's get the Bible open. Book of James. Now, for this series, which will last just over two months, you're going to want to bring your Bible or your Bible app on your phone. And uh, today we're in the first chapter uh, and the reason you need your Bible is you need to read this stuff because you're wanna, gonna wanna go back to the verses. We're gonna memorize a verse today and you're gonna wanna go back to the text. All right, so the whole letter written by Jesus' little brother. His name is? Very good. And uh, he is Mary's second born son. He's Mary and Joseph's first born son. And you gotta wrap your brain around that. Um, the son of the most high God being raised in a family family in the first century. He's got four brothers, he's got two sisters, um, and you just got to wonder, what was it like for James to grow up as Jesus' little brother? Was that awesome? Or was that just a lot of pressure? Um, I imagine him going to school, you know, following Jesus through school. Every teacher, oh, you're Jesus' little brother. I had Jesus last year in my class. Hope you're just like him. Uh, or you misbehave at home and your dad just looks at you. You know, they've already, they've been raising Jesus and now they've got you. <laughs> you know. And your dad just says, James, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Mary, let's make him a little bracelet he can wear. Truthfully, though, it would have been unusual for Jesus' siblings when he came of age and walked away from the family business and uh, decided to become a rabbi. Um, people were soon flocking to Jesus. They were hoping that he was the Messiah. Uh, but to James and his siblings, Jesus of Nazareth was Jesus, our brother. And uh, they would have struggled to see him as anything more. Actually, most everyone in Nazareth struggled with this. We know this because Jesus returned to the synagogue in Nazareth as an adult, and he was uh, uh, speaking, uh, and the way they did it back then, they would, they would have a, a scripture reading for that day. The scripture reading was uh, the scroll of Isaiah, and then the different folks would comment to it, and Jesus was uh, the first one to speak. And he said, well, that scripture that was just read, that's me. That's a, I'm the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. The Spirit of God has anointed me to do these things. Well, the prophecy was about the Messiah. So they took great offense at this and, uh, you know, saying, you, you're just Joseph's son. Now, throughout, uh, especially the Galilee region, but actually everywhere, for the next three years, thousands of people flocked to Jesus. On one occasion, uh, there were 5,000 families listening to him teach there on the, the, um, the hillside outside of the Galilee in that natural amphitheater that's there. Uh, and some of those people became his closest followers. But I'll tell you who didn't follow Jesus, his own brothers and sisters. Uh, Mark tells us that Jesus was in a house one day and it was so packed that it uh, Mary, uh, the, 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 the brothers and sisters were just outside the house. They couldn't get in, but they said, send Jesus out. We're, we're going to take him home. He's out of his mind. Jesus went all the way to the cross with only his mother as his only uh, supportive family member. But that was Friday. 
And then Sunday, everything changed when Christ defeated death and then started appearing, appearing to his friends to prove to them that he was who he had claimed to be and then to rehash all the scriptures now that he had uh, come back from the, from the dead. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus sought out his baby brother James and met with him personally and James was amazed to discover who Jesus really was. So 50 days later, when the Holy Spirit fell on the believers at Pentecost, Jesus' mother was there, Jesus' brothers were there, they were part of the church now. They were believers, and they were among the group that, that, that received the boldness to preach and to lead. Now, I have always thought that a key proof that Jesus really was who he said he was was that his own brothers and sisters and his own mother became his followers. Uh, even though he had been born in their home and raised among them, they all eventually became uh, Christians. Imagine that, your brother claiming to be the son of God and the savior of the world, and after time, you buying into that and calling him not your big brother of Jesus, but your Lord and savior, the son of God. That's exactly what James is gonna do. Uh, he soon becomes a key leader among the very first Christians. He took the lead in what became known as the Jerusalem Council. Whenever there was an important decision to be made, uh, the council would gather, led by Peter, James, and John. And, uh, and then in AD 36, Stephen was martyred. A great persecution recorded in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, broke out. And, uh, and, and the Jewish authorities began going house to house, arresting and abusing Christians. The church was scattered. The majority of the Christ followers left everything, running for their lives, resettling as refugees all over the world. And then a famine hit Judea. And the, with Christians sitting at the bottom of the, the food chain, many more of them left the Jerusalem church for where they could find some food to eat. James stayed behind, pastoring that church, doing everything he could to parcel out whatever meager resources uh, were left. And at some point, he wrote this book, the book of James, the first New Testament book written, and he writes, James, a servant of God, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Well, you have to stop there because his humility is evident to anyone who reads. No one would have faulted him for writing, James, the little brother of Jesus, no one would have uh, criticized him at all for saying, James, the leader of the Jerusalem council. But he just says, James, the slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He already had some nicknames. Some people called him James the Just because he was so fair and so holy in his judgments, uh, respected by everyone as wise. Uh, others knew him as old camel knees. It wasn't, they weren't mocking him. They admired him because he had prayed so much that his knees had developed large calluses as he grew older. Uh, it was less than 20 years after he wrote this letter that he was martyred, uh, taken to the top of the tallest building in Judea, the temple, uh, taken to the edge of the temple and told to recant his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the Pharisees who were up there with him. Instead, he chose to preach to the crowd below the resurrection of Christ, so they shoved him off the building. He fell headlong and landed, didn't kill him. As a matter of fact, he was still conscious when the people picked up the stones to finish him off. They could hear him praying for them as he was martyred, just like Jesus on the cross. And he refused to deny Jesus even when it meant death. He opens his letter to the diaspora, to the scattered Christians. Here's what he says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Uh, celebrate the terrible things that all of you are facing. They're wonderful. Now this is the way the whole book is gonna read. You're gonna read it and go, what? what? His words seem insensitive to say the least, out of touch. Imagine if you were going through the hardest time of your life and a letter comes from Jerusalem and you're, 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 you're suffering where you are, you're, you don't know the language, you're being persecuted even there because you're part of a minority population that people don't seem to like. 
Um, and you get a letter from Jerusalem, from old camel knees, and you think, okay, here's going to be some encouragement. He's going to write us, and, and, and he's going to give us some encouragement. Instead, he says, yeah, I heard you were suffering. Yeah, we are. Well, that's fantastic. It's awesome that you're being tested so severely. Celebrate those sorry circumstances. Your pain is a blessing. Uh, This is testing your faith, and it's going to produce something great. You should have such joy about this. Joy. Are you kidding me? Yes, he says. Consider it pure joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces Perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This thing is gonna complete you. If you will consider this, if you will evaluate what is happening to you and what it's going to produce in you, you would stop feeling sorry for yourself and you would embrace it and say, I am going to become stronger, better, more pure as a believer. This is an opportunity for my faith to be tested. Now, this is such a purposeful and direct opening statement. James writes so differently than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul opens all his letters with a sweet greeting, sometimes a prayer. James just goes right at it. He reminds me of some of my closest friends when we get together and one of us is going through a tough time. We don't beat around the bush. We, 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 we just talk, you know, how, how are you doing? Come on, be honest, it's me, your friend. And you know, we give each other great perspective, iron sharpening iron. This is what James is doing. He's treating us like family. He's treating us like friends. You're, 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 this test feels like a bad thing, and you may have even said it's a bad thing, but it's not. You prayed for God to release you from it, and he didn't. Therefore, it's his purpose, it's his will in your life. You should celebrate that God is working out something in you. Let perseverance finish its work. Don't bail on on Jesus before he has a chance to bring you through. Determine here and now that you'll do more than just survive this awful trial. You'll come through it stronger. Perseverance, the Greek word, perseverance, hupomone. Some of your Bibles say endurance. Some of your Bibles say patience. Hupo, under, meno, to stay, to remain, to abide, to not try to escape. The vision of someone is of someone, and you, they put a heavy load on their back, and they say, all right, I've got to carry this thing. And then they start putting one foot in front of the other. The word is not a passive patience. Don't picture yourself waiting at the doctor's office with that, that silly music playing while, while the, you know, it takes another half an hour before they can see you. But you're, you have a smile on your face. You're waiting. No, it's nothing like that. This word describes a marathon runner, 22 miles in, where his, 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 his thighs are burning, his lungs are screaming out, stop, give us a break. But he had decided at the beginning of the race he was going to finish the race, no matter what, no matter how he felt. He knew this was going to happen at some point. And he's going to power through to the finish line. That's what this letter is all about. For the next two months... James is going to give you everything but sympathy. Because when you're in a trial, sympathy feels great. But it's like comfort food. It's not what you needed. You don't need sympathy. You need a trainer to say, hey, come on. Let's go. Nobody promised you that this was going to be easy. You set these goals to follow after Christ closely. This is what that is about. Let's go. Friends, at times this life will test you to your very limits. You will be tempted to turn around and just let the current take you back. And during those seasons, sympathy feels good, but what you need is a kick in the butt. What you need is someone to say, oh, okay, so you're a quitter now. You're a quitter You're just going to quit on Jesus. You need someone to challenge you to keep moving forward. In the words of the Pixar star, Dory. In the classic, Finding Nemo. Keep on swimming. Keep on swimming. Embrace the trial with joy, knowing that the testing of our faith produces 
perseverance. Let's learn this together. The testing of our faith, say that. The testing of our faith. Produces perseverance. Say it together. Say it together. The testing of our faith produces perseverance. The testing of our faith produces perseverance. Come on. Testing of our faith. You know, my wife says, you could get those people to do absolutely anything. (laughs) But I did that in order to get it into your brain. As a matter of fact, let's get the whole sentence into our brain. Consider it pure joy. Say that. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because we know that do it again. Close your eyes. I'll help you. Consider pure joy. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, say that. Because we know. Say it. Perseverance says keep on running. The race isn't over. Although sometimes it feels like it'll never end. Ask the parent who's raising that special needs child into adulthood. Ask the single mom who's got the kids. Every morning, same routine. Every night. Day after day after day. She tells, (laughs) ha, ha, ha. She takes him on vacation. She still works as hard as she ever does. Hmm. Talk to the cancer victim in their fifth round of chemo when round four almost killed him. When is this going to end, they say. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. James is telling us what attitude to choose. Choose joy. You know, you can't choose your tests, but you can choose your attitude. Our perspective as believers in Christ is that when any hard thing comes, we assume, we assume that God wants to take it away. So we ask him to do it in faith. It doesn't go away. We ask him again. It doesn't go away. We ask him again. It doesn't go away. The Bible says ask, ask, ask. We ask and ask and ask. But at some point, it occurs to us that this trial is being allowed by God. And is not going to go away until the trial is over. And at that point, we have a decision to make. We have to choose our attitude. And our attitude will dictate our actions. And we will say, you know what? This thing, is God's allowing it. And we'll even have Christian friends that say, hey, I'm still being prayed that you be released from that. And you're like, you might say, well, thank you. But just so you know, I think God's allowing this. No, brother, where's your faith? I'll tell you where my faith is. My faith is in God, not in, him t- not in him doing what I tell him to do. My faith is in the one who knows how to train me. My faith is in the one who promised that he will not give me anything beyond what I can handle. He must think a lot of me because this sucks. Strong language for some of you, but deep down, that's how we feel when we go through something terrible. Nothing causes a person to grow more spiritually, mentally, emotionally than enduring a hard trial. It's what completes us as human beings, making weak muscles strong. We become faith people, refusing to let circumstances dictate our response where we once thought God was wanting to make us happy. We discover that he's trying to make us holy, And holiness comes through the fire. Friends, you will never be the human being you could have been if you don't endure trials. That's why James says, cheer up about all this. You're becoming someone. The trial is training you. Yes, of course it hurts. But it won't destroy you. Instead, it will develop you. It will complete you. If your life is too easy, you will remain soft. If you are always coddled, you will remain a baby. Muscles that are never strained will atrophy, and you do not want that. In verse 3, James chooses a Greek word that has been translated into the phrase, the testing of your faith. It's one word, actually. The word was used back then for the process of purifying silver. 
The silversmith knew there's only one way to purify the metal. Do you know what that is? Fire. It has to be heated to the point of liquefaction so that the impurities either burn or rise to the surface. And then they are scooped off uh, by, by, by the, the, the refiner. She knows that the metal is pure when after it's cooled, she can see her reflection in the silver. When the silver is dull and full of impurities, she knows that another round of testing has to take place because she wants to see a reflection. Once she sees a reflection, she knows, I've got the pure thing. This becomes very valuable to her. That's what Christ is after, his reflection in you once the trial takes you through. So James encourages you not to see the tough season as something bad, but the opposite. Wisdom says it's good. Look at verse five. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That's a promise. By the way, this book is full of promises. As you read it through, count the promises. And count the commands. There's about 107-ish verses in this uh, book, and there's over 50 commands. James is coming at us saying, like, a, come on, let me tell you what to do. Let me tell you what to do. Let me tell you what to do. The book of James is about action. Wisdom says, wisdom says, God is in this. Yeah, maybe it's the devil attacking you, but God is allowing it. Yeah, maybe it's life circumstances coming your way. God has allowed it. Wisdom, see, in these situations, you don't need more knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the, is the ability to know what to do with those facts. Knowledge is the ability to take something apart. Wisdom is the ability to put it back together. If you're wondering why God hasn't rescued you from this trial, just ask him for wisdom. Ask him to lift you up above the current situation so you can look down and you can see it for what it is and that it had a beginning and an end. And when it's over, you're gonna be better for it. How will you have grown when you start to cool down after the fire? Will the test have burned away the things in you that are not like Jesus? You know, I preach this today knowing there's only three types of people listening to me. There are those that, uh, that, that, that are in a trial. There are those that have just come out of a trial. And there are those that will soon be in one. James says, when you are tested, not if you are tested. We all go through things that we would not have chosen. So when that happens, I encourage you to say, there it is. James and Pastor Steve alerted me to this. I'm so glad that I went to church to hear this. This letter is written to all of us. And, and you know, if life is easy for you, don't go looking for a trial. <laughs> you don't need to do that. <laughs> Celebrate, enjoy, order appetizers. <laughs> if you've just come through a rough patch, celebrate that as well. You know, regroup. And if you're in the middle of a tough season, celebrate that. That God is right now refining you. And what will remain in the end is Christ in you. Ask God for wisdom you need to persevere and the understanding that you need for it to make sense. But look at verse six. Here's the warning. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Friends, a person could ask for wisdom but then not believe that God is actually gonna give it. If we ask for anything but don't believe, we become spiritually conflicted, asking for something we really don't think God will provide. James says this creates a schizophrenia in us, a, a double-mindedness, uh, making us unstable in every way. The psalmist says, I don't want to be like that. <clears throat> Lord, give me an undivided heart, one that doesn't second guess my faith. 
James compares the, the double-minded person to a, a boat in a storm on the sea, and the, the boat has lost its rudder, it's lost its sail, the weather is tossing it around and threatened to sink them, or at least they think they're gonna sink. They're like the disciples in that storm in the Galilee who, who panicked. Remember that story? Jesus gets in the boat, he says, we're going to the other side, storm hits. Jesus is obviously not worried. He's taking a nap. They have to wake him up so he can panic alongside of them. What they hadn't figured out yet was that they had the creator of wind and waves in the boat with them. Now, Jesus is in your boat, and he's already said you're going to make it to the other side. The storm is just a detail. You're not going to sink. Folks, when we get caught in a storm, the question is not, could this storm sink my boat? The question is, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Just hang on to Jesus. That's the best life preserver imaginable. Hang on to Jesus. It's Christ who has said, just ask and you'll receive. You want wisdom? James says, ask for it. You'll get it. Every time. And a small amount of wisdom is better than a large amount of knowledge. Because knowledge never takes away fear. Only wisdom can do that. Just lower your head and reach down for the faith that was put in your hands by Jesus himself and then refuse the urge to second guess your faith in the middle of the storm. When life feels uncertain, anchor yourself even tighter to the Lord. Build your life now on the solid foundation when it's not stormy so that when, not if, the storm hits, you will have already anchored to the rock. That's why we regularly attend church. That's why we regularly are part of a community group where we have fellowship with other brothers and sisters. Because it's in those seasons when you don't need it as much that you're actually doing the work. Have you noticed that construction workers usually work when it's not storming? That's what you do as well. You build the house before you need it to be able to survive a storm. You going through some tough times today? Hang in there. At the end of the sermon, we're all gonna pray for you. And you are going to receive the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. But let's keep studying for a little bit. Verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. James is reminding us here that there will be an end to this trial. At the end of the grueling race, there is a victor, and the victor is promised a crown. So don't ever allow a good trial to go to waste. Every trial has its crown at the end. Allow this thing to run its course so you come through and win the crown. And, and then, then you can use the word blessed. I'm blessed. You know, some people use this word blessed so much, it's just annoying. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. What does that mean? You got a new car? <laughs> the truly blessed person is the one that God has taken through something really hard. And now they appreciate their relationship with God even, even more. Uh, the truly blessed person is the person who has lost everything and gained Christ. James is going to sound a lot like this all the way through the book. Watch for these juxtapositions where it doesn't sound logical, like to, to rejoice when you hit a trial, to consider it pure joy, he says. And, and Jesus talked like this too. You notice Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, when you're weak, you're strong. When you're poor, you're rich. When you mourn, you are to celebrate. Jesus would tell you what James is gonna tell you. There's more to life than what we can see, and feelings will often betray us. So the wise Christ follower doesn't always go with their gut. Because believe it or not, your gut can fool you. The wise Christ follower celebrates when others complain and moan and whine, when others give up. The wise Christ follower chooses joy because they really do believe that something is happening here and they really do believe that all things work together for good, for those that are called, for those who love the Lord. Now, that's not saying that, th that, that, that life will resolve completely in this life. 
I mean, you gotta read this book. All of these authors were martyred. The last day on planet Earth was the worst day of their life. They didn't get to a certain point and go, oh, everything's resolved, everything worked out. No, they, everything didn't resolve for them until after they passed. Jesus himself, his life didn't completely make sense, even to his own followers, until after he suffered death. Then it all came together. Friends, all things work together for good, but for some of us, you will actually die of cancer. Some of us will pass away before the prodigal comes home. But then in that great grandstand in heaven written about in the book of Hebrews, we will look down and we'll see life piecing together. And here comes the prodigal back home after our funeral. And we say, oh, that's what it took for them to miss me enough to want to spend eternity with me. Oh. Look for life to make sense eventually. And remember that your death is not the end of your life. Hmm. Let's do one more, one more verse and then we're going to go to prayer. One more thought. Because James shifts now in verse 13 from talking about a test or a trial <clears throat> to talking about when we're tempted to do something we shouldn't do. And he ties the two together in a beautiful way, but they're two different things. A trial is a temptation to give up, but a temptation is, a, is, is something where we, we, we reach out and grab for something that we should have not reached out for. Verse 13, James says, now when you're tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Look at the word enticed. We're going to come back to it. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Now look for James to mix his metaphor. He talks about childbirth as if sin is conceived in us and then over time is birthed into, into death. And we won't have time for that one today, but that's one you could really sit with. Let's go back to the word enticed because I love the word he used here. This is a fishing word. He uses the word which you could call taking the bait. And I, I love to fish. Uh, whether we're wading a stream in the Sierras or floating the lower Sacramento, there's nothing like getting a wild trout to think that that fly is real fly and there's not a hook inside of it. I don't know what it is, you just, you catch that fish, and when you, you catch it, you know, we're catch and release in my neck of the woods, and so when you catch it, you take a quick picture, and you release that fish, and what you've done is you've given that fish wisdom, but before you give that fish wisdom, you hold it in your hands, you go, ha, 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 I'm the man! <laughs> so you take a picture of one of these pigs, and, and then you can show it to your friend, and say, yeah, you were working all day, look what I was doing, uh... Or, or you can, or, 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 or like this gal that caught a fish. She tricked this fish into thinking that she would. There wasn't a fisherman on the other side. There wasn't a fisherwoman on the other. That, that fish is a. That fly is a tasty snack. James says people are just like those fish. What keeps that fish from hitting that fly is the experience and the instinct that says something's wrong with that. With that right there. That's bait. Maybe they heard the vibrations of the fishermen talking. Maybe they saw a reflection of the fishermen. Boy, these, these older fish are smart, the wild ones especially. You need to be smart too. You know, as you get older, most of the temptations that you face, you faced them before. And if you just said, wait, 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 wait. I've seen this one before. Why am I hanging around this? Why am I circling this bait kind of thinking, well, maybe it's this time. It, it won't catch me. No. That's what we're praying for you this week if you're facing temptation. And all of us will be. All of us will face temptation this week. That you'll see it for what it is and get out of there as quickly as you can before your mind plays tricks on you and you talk yourself into it. And if you're going through the most difficult trial right now, we want to wrap up this time by praying for you. Uh, we're going to pray for you that, that, that God gives you the wisdom, that you ask for the wisdom to know how to deal with what you're dealing with. You ask him for the perseverance that you, you don't think you have. You, you're strengthened by choosing joy. 
Now, during this week, you'll, you'll be more alone than you are right now. So for right now, we're just gonna pray for you. During this week, you're gonna have to pray for yourself. But right now, I want you to receive the prayer. Who are you that would say, I really am going through a tough time? Who are you? Who are you? Wave your hand. Let people around you see it. I'm going through a tough time. All right, let's pray for these folks now. Church, join me. Let's intercede. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters that they would consider it pure joy instead of what they've been considering. We pray for our brothers and sisters, and we wish they weren't going through this trial. But if you've allowed it, we also want to see it as a good thing, and we want them to see it as a good thing. Not a pleasant thing, but a good thing. Because all things that are good are not necessarily pleasant. Help them to see it as the training of their faith, the development of their own wisdom and experience that will be used in later situations and circumstances, even if just to encourage another believer who's going through a trial. Lord, I remember uh, that time when I was going through that deep depression and those panic attacks and that anxiety that would hit me every morning at nine o'clock, like clockwork, the cold sweats and the... The, all of that, and I didn't know what it was, and I was embarrassed as I went through those times, and I didn't want to tell anybody, and then you brought me through, and, and now I've been able to help so many men, especially, who have gone through, wondering if they're losing their mind, and in actuality, they're just going through a very common thing, and Lord, as you took that trial in my life, and it produced such pure gold out of it. I pray that the trials that the Cornerstone family are facing on an individual basis would, would eventually come together and we would become such a great resource to our, our neighbors, our community, our coworkers, our friends, our family, where we could say, you know what? God brought me through a time a lot like that and he can bring you through as well. Father, I pray for those of us that have suffered great loss recently that something would be found in that loss. Lord, I pray for those of us that have mourned recently that we would find joy. I pray for those of us that have had nothing but conflict, we would find peace, a peace that surpasses anyone's understanding. And then from deep within would come a response that would shock people. How are you doing so well, they ask. And our response is, Jesus, Jesus. I'm being strengthened by Jesus and being taught by his little brother, James, out of a letter he wrote to those who were scattered all over the world. Father, be with us during this series. Help us to step up and hear the challenge and then respond to it. And we pray all of these things in Christ's precious name and all of God's people said.